Do you know what? The trouble is that there are so many different forms of comedian. I think the idea that there's one particular archetype, and I've read old papers from the 70s where they've tried to go, this is a comedian, and it's not true. The initial starting point of the book was just, I made a documentary about comedians and mental health and the myths around it as well as some of the truths around it and talked to people like Joe Brown, Ross Noble, all manner of people. At that point, I was, I was speaking to a few therapists. I didn't really speak to any neuroscientists. It was more of a kind of general cultural look. And that was kind of what the book was gonna be. And then everything changed. And as I got further into writing the book, I realized more and more that I think it's so important to actually embed things with something which is evidence-based. The starting point of every chapter, and indeed a, a, the main body of a lot of it, is about comedy. But I hope, and what I've found out so far from people who've read it, is they did get the fact that the comedians are being used as the anatomical model, but by looking at that model, we're actually looking at all humans. Because if uh, a comedian goes on stage and they say something that's so detached from what, what your imagination is able to uh, comprehend or what your own personal experience involves, then you won't be able to in any way really make contact with them. So I was using them as the big bellowing examples of what all humans are. Because this is actually a book that's led me to going into therapy, which is, you know, I thought it would do the opposite. What happened was uh, I, I interviewed five therapists for the book, and at the end of almost every interview they said oh I presume you're in therapy Robin and I said no and they went oh and uh, so I, I've kind of and what I find this to me is something which I think is overarching in the book but it's never actually said specifically is one of the most fascinating things of the nature of our experience and memory and our passing through time is that the further away we get from instance the more we are able to sometimes understand them. Impulsive Thoughts was one of the ones that I found fascinating, which I, I did a show that, well originally it wasn't a show about that, but I ended up talking to so many people about it. The show just built and built and built. You know, the weird thoughts we have when you're holding a baby and you suddenly imagine throwing the baby out of the window or down some stairs um, or standing on a train station platform. And, and you might imagine two sides. You might imagine, oh, what if I pushed that person in front of me? Or what if I leapt in front of the train? All of these different forms of thought. People can keep them inside and they can think that they're a freak, they're some kind of psychotic. Um, and in fact, they're very normal. Most people have strange impulsive thoughts and the danger is if you keep them inside and if you start to feel that you are an alien, that you are the, you know, the aberrant one, then it can build and it can become obsessive compulsive behavior, it can become obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, when I used to talk about throwing, it was a, such an exciting moment I would find. I would talk about that moment when you're holding a baby and maybe you're holding it near a cliff and suddenly out of nowhere you think, oh my God, I just imagine throwing the baby over the cliff. And, and you desperately try and hand it back to the mother explaining that your just arms are tired, you haven't just imagined throwing the baby over the cliff. And I would say to an audience, I'd say, who here has had those thoughts? Um, sometimes two hands would go up, sometimes 20, sometimes 100. Occasionally, very occasionally, none. And then there would be a suspenseful moment where I would say, now you people who put your hands up, you people, well, you need to know about yourselves. And sometimes the other 80% would think, oh good, I'm glad I didn't put my hand up. Well, everyone in this room knows to know, especially about you in the front who put your hand up first. They need to know that you are the safest pair of hands to hold a baby. Because actually what is going on when you have those impulsive thoughts is we are a creature that is aware of so many different forms of jeopardy that when we're given a position of responsibility like holding the baby, we actually play a little public information film in our head. And it goes, you're holding a baby. So remember, when holding a baby, don't throw it over a cliff. But it's delivered in such a snappy way that we mistake that for do we have a desire? And of course, the fact is that you didn't start off by going, hmm, I could throw, oh no, I better not do that. There's no smile in that thought. The first moment you have that thought, there's a sense of shock and horror. And you know, and, and I've read case studies and I've spoken to people who've kept things in and then found it harder. And there was a guy who came up to me at a show and he said, oh, I'm so glad you talked about that. He said, my oldest sister's had a baby and the first time she passed me the baby, I had this horrible thought and, and, and I imagine throwing the baby down. And now I make excuses for not holding the baby. I mean, what I loved, there was one show that I did where a man came up, in fact, it happened to me more than once, actually, but this was in, in, in Nottingham, where a man came up to me and he said, I'm quite annoyed with you. 
I've always believed that I'm quite weird, but I've just sat in with your audience and I've watched your show and I've realised we're all bloody weird, which means I'm quite normal, which is frankly disappointing. And so that bit of realising we are a properly absurd creature 